Good morning, good afternoon, whatever time of day it is. Hello, my name is Anthony Griffin, and I'll be covering the topic of bioinformatics and microbiology today. I hope you enjoy. As an overview of what I intend to go over, please refer to this table of contents. I'll begin with an introduction to microbiology and how the accumulation of information-rich data demands intuitive, complex computational analysis. Then I shall cover the basics behind genetic sequencing and its subsequent annotation. I'll describe how genetic sequences can be compiled and analyzed to develop microbial community profiles. Finally, I'll end by describing how bioinformatics is revolutionizing the microbiology field of today and how it will likely impact the future. Now, to be considered microbial, an organism must have a mass less than 10 to negative 5 grams and a length less than 500 micrometers. In other words, it has to be incredibly small. Taking it, taken in its entirety, the microbial world is dense. Unfathomably dense, really. In fact, one gram of soil may harbor up to 10 billion microorganisms, potentially representing thousands of different species. It's also important to note that this level of microbial diversity does not only extend to the outside environment, but also has something to do with every one of us, as our gut microbiome has proven to be incredibly diverse and a subject of interest in investigating dozens of human diseases and conditions. The picture on the right shows villi, which are finger-like cellular components that jut out of the small intestine, and they're the home of dozens of microbial species all of which have been marked in green. Understanding the microbial world could answer hundreds of living questions that we have in respect to our environment and our own health. However, classical methods behind microbiology had a rather limited scope. The classical way in which microbes were studied was through culturing them. Culturing is describing the process of growing bacterial species on a plate or test tube in the laboratory. This approach comes with two main drawbacks. The first involves the observation that most microbes are unculturable, requiring the unique environment which they originate to live or to grow. For instance, some of the most genetically distinct microbes live in thermal events in the ocean and in the geysers of Yellowstone National Park. To replicate the extremely hot and chemically complex environment of these thermal vents in a controlled laboratory setting is practically impossible. Not to mention, in more common environments, it is also nearly impossible to predict the growth constraints of species we may not even know are present. Additionally, with culturing microbes, there is a myopic emphasis on one species or set of genes at a time. Scientists typically aren't capable of culturing dozens of species at once, given the cost and intense maintenance that they would need. Based on the sheer number of microorganisms, focusing on one species will not reveal much about the functioning biological ecosystem. Fortunately, in response to these drawbacks, there has been a dramatic renaissance of microbiology, with the transition to genetic sequencing as the primary method of analysis. To really explore the new status quo of microbiology, and to go over all the latest methods of genetic sequencing, would take up a huge amount of time. But in the interest of not boring you all with the details, I'll only cover the basic principles, but encourage those who are interested to look into next-generation sequencing. I've included hyperlinks that refer to three of the most popular genetic sequencing techniques, with Illumina being one of them, a San Diego biotech company. The important takeaway in the evolution of these technologies is that sequencing is now widely available and significantly cheaper than what it used to be only a decade ago. With that in mind, scientists can now easily incorporate genetic sequencing into their workflow. For instance, imagine you're a scientist and you'd like to know which microbial species are present in a certain environment. First, you must acquire a sample from the environment in question. The sample may come in the form of a liquid, if you're investigating species of an ocean or lake. It may also come in the form of a fecal sample, given the microbial species of our feces are the same for those that are present in our gut. But regardless of its origin, the sample is then purified and broken down into individual contiguous DNA or RNA sequences. The reason why I specify maybe either DNA or RNA has to do with the fact that some microbes only have RNA, such as viruses, and that sometimes it's easier to compare RNA to differentiate between different organisms. Either way, these sequences are used to identify microbial species. If the question the scientist is trying to answer demands it, then they may also analyze individual sequences and break apart into various components to analyze their functions. But before getting too ahead of ourselves, let us return to step number three in which we seek to identify microbial species. At this point, we've successfully derived DNA or RNA sequences, but know nothing about them other than in what order the nucleotides are arranged. So how does one figure out the sequence identity? How would a scientist find out that the microbe's DNA 
that they have in their possession is actually representative of E. coli, a traditional model organism? Well, there's a few considerations that have to be made. First, all cellular life has a shared evolutionary history, and some genes are shared by all organisms. The sequences of those genes can be used as a genetic fingerprint. So let's assume our organisms can be identified by a small portion of, the, of their DNA and we already know of an evolutionary sequence that all of their DNA is derived from. How we identify and compare what may be entirely unknown species is by looking at the random accumulation of mutations in this evolutionary sequence. By mutations, I'm referring to any changes to their genetic sequences that occurred over evolutionary time. To put this all in context, this diagram is a phylogeny, which basically means it is describing the evolutionary relationship between a number of species, in this case five. The evolutionary sequence that all four five organisms share is on the far left. On the right, the species are grouped based on how close their sequences match up to each other, and the branch length corresponds to the evolutionary time or how long it took for certain mutations to take hold. In the five sequences on the right, all the nucleotides highlighted red are places in which the sequences differ from each other. As you can see, no one sequence is the same. But the level of differentiation provides adequate information for scientists to predict how these species relate to each other and what their identity may be. Of course, the data traditionally is a lot denser than what we see here with comparisons between hundreds of nucleotides needed to determine their identities. There are a few key programs that take care of this computationally taxing problem. These computational programs basically take advantage of large genomic libraries. BLAST, which stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool, is one of those programs. In using this tool, one simply inputs their query DNA sequence, for instance, a sequence isolated from the environment, and BLAST returns the most closely related species or genes. The basic way it does so is by breaking down the sequence into individual words. Often, a word is a smaller sequence of three letters, or three nucleotides, in other words. Then each word is compared with sequences in the database of the National Center for Biotechnology Information, which basically contains hundreds of thousands of sequences that we already know the identity of. If there is a match, the algorithm will extend the alignment of the sequence by another three nucleotides, continuing the process until the sequences from the database with the most matches are returned. From this information, the scientists can make educated guesses on the identity of the species present and begin analyzing their sample on a more holistic basis. In other words, after a scientist has identified all the microbial species present, there are a few more questions they're capable of answering. First, how many species are there? This question can take on many additional qualities, asking for the richness of a certain environment or how evenly distributed an environment may be. Since this question is asking about a single sample's composition, the scientist is trying to assess its alpha diversity. The second question that comes to mind is how your sample compares with others. In other words, how similar are pairs of samples? When comparing your sample to another, you're asking for information on its beta diversity. Now let's break that down a little further by first looking at alpha diversity. I'll use two examples for both types of diversity, but keep in mind there are dozens of more techniques currently available. The first technique is in looking at the observed OTUs. OTU stands for Operational Taxonomic Unit, which basically is a way of classifying your data set into groups. Most commonly, an OTU refers to a single individual or organism. This method is perhaps the simplest way to assess diversity since it only involves counting the number of OTUs in your sample. If you take a look at this table, you can see in sample 1, there are 25 organisms of species 1, 4 to 6 organisms of species 2, and only three organisms of species three. Meanwhile, Faith's phylogenetic diversity, abbreviated Faith's PD, takes into account the evolutionary relationship of the organisms in one sample. We once again consider phylogenies. For instance, imagine sample one has species A, B, and C as labeled here in this phylogeny. By counting all the branch lengths associated with A, B, and C, one can determine Faith's PD of the sample. So you simply add 5 plus 2 plus 1 equals 8. Through either a combination of these two methods or other alternatives, scientists can get a firm basis on the richness of a single sample. But what if you have questions on the composition of this sample and how it relates to another? Then of course we must consult beta diversity metrics. Due to the more simple options, 
are depicted here. Jacquard is a more binary approach to the question, simply indicating a shared species across samples with a zero and a one if it is not shared. For example, say there are a total of 10 different species across two samples, and these two samples only have six species in common, which of course means there are four species that are unique to either sample. For every unique species, you must add one. Then you divide this sum by the total number of species, which in our case is 10. So in other words, four unique species, 10 total species. Four divided by 10 equals 0 0.4, your final Jacquard distance. It's as simple as that. And the pattern holds, of course, when you compare every sample and the associated species. But a big weakness of Jacquard is that there's no consideration for each species abundance. So species may be present, but would be overrepresented by Jacquard if there's only a single organism there. Bray Curtis considers abundance and it has a more diverse scaling technique with values comparing samples from zero to one. A value of zero implies that both samples share the exact same species with the same abundance. One indicates the opposite, with completely different species abundance. The likelihood of either extreme case is unlikely. So more often the Bray Curtis distance takes on values like 0 0.55, 0 0.98, etc. Either way, both biodiversity metrics end up with a distance matrix, comparing dozens, perhaps even hundreds of samples at once. This distance matrix is used as two dimensions of a graph, with the columns representing the x-coordinates and the rows standing in for the y-coordinates. This can lead to rather pretty, information-rich data visualizations. The image on the left can be extrapolated from alpha diversity metrics. As you can see, the y-axis is labeled as the percentage of OTUs, so they simply converted the number of each species from each sample as a ratio of the total number of organisms present. They did so for different regions of the body, as you can see in the labels for the x-axis. For instance, there's a label for a sample of saliva and a sample of stool. The image to the right, on the other hand, is derived from a multi-dimensional dataset. Without getting too bogged in the details, to convert the original complex dataset to a simple two-dimensional distance matrix, there are different statistical manipulations that can be done, one of which is called UMAP. Each point on the graph corresponds to a different sample. I actually worked on this visualization as a part of my work in Dr. Kelly's lab and pulled information from a study that was looking at microbial growth across different building materials, such as gypsum and plywood. As you can see, there is distinct clustering for each building material, suggesting that there are microbes specific to each material type. Now, if these visualizations are still a little confusing to you, that's okay. This is just meant to be an introduction and to basically showcase a small fraction of what bioinformatics methods are capable of. And personally, I'm incredibly excited to see how other visualization techniques may evolve and contribute to future lines of research. As for what these future lines of research may be, I'll showcase two developments in the field that I find particularly interesting. The first involves interactions between pharmaceuticals and our gut bacteria. In 2018, a team of researchers screened more than 1,000 drugs on 40 strains of gut bacteria, finding that one quarter of the drugs had an antibiotic effect, reducing the gut bacterial composition. Typically, you would assume an antibiotic effect sounds like a good thing, given these are pharmaceuticals, they're trying to stop something in the body, right? But in this case, the drugs are killing healthy bacteria. And by healthy bacteria, I'm referring to the species in our gut that actually help us metabolize food and aid in other critical biological processes. So these antibiotic effects may result in dozens of other dangerous conditions or comorbidities later in someone's life. Additionally, in 2019, another team found that of 271 drugs they studied, 176 were metabolized by gut bacteria to an extent that they were 20% less effective. So in the interest of human health, Researchers are trying to find the exact mechanisms behind how a drug might be adversely affecting the microbiome and how in turn the microbiome may be reducing drug efficacy. From a more ecological perspective, there's a severe danger in the effects of climate change on global microbial ecosystems. As is the case for most ecosystems around the world, a rise in temperatures or extreme climate variation leads to a drop in biodiversity. However, many overlook marine and microorganisms and their response to climate change, despite the census of marine life estimating that 90% of the marine biomass is microbial. 
And these microbes actually have critical roles in the regulation of biogeochemical cycles, the marine food webs, and coral reef ecosystems, to name a few. Take microscopic phytoplankton as an example, which performs half of the global carbon dioxide fixation and contribute to half of the global oxygen production. They are crucial to the maintenance of our climate, but their populations are dwindling. So researchers are now placing emphasis on observing how these microbial species are at risk and how they may be saved to hopefully offset some of the effects they predict to happen due to climate change. That concludes my presentation, and here's a slide that comprises all my references. I especially want to call attention to those from Nature Magazine, given they recently released a bunch of articles on gut microbiome research which of course involved the work of dozens of bioinformaticians. I didn't get an opportunity to be very code heavy in this presentation, but you may look forward to my third and final presentation as I'll review Python script analyzing microbial data. Thank you.